I'm delighted to be able to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Jonathan Roberts. Jonathan is a member of MBR's Board of Directors, and uh, he comes today to represent the board and speak in his own capacity as a technologist. He's a founder and partner at Ignition Partners, the Pacific Northwest's largest venture capital firm. Um, Jonathan led a number of Ignition Partners investments, most notably DocuSign, in which Ignition was the first institutional investor. He's also the co-founder of R Prime, which is his current passion, I think, a not-for-profit that uses a digital platform with a powerful suite of tools that connect, deepen, and expand relationships for civic and faith-based organizations. And as I said, he's on our board of directors. Uh, now in his third term, it's a delight to be able to part work, partner with him on the work of MBR. And Jonathan, we're so glad you can be here and say a few words. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roy. I feel uh, uniquely well qualified to welcome you to Seattle because I have the rare distinction of never living outside of a 10 mile radius. So uh, now with that said, you're looking forward to an entirely provincial um, set of comments. But uh, no, I went to uh, school here, I went to the University of Washington, Microsoft, uh, venture capital firm, but I was always able to do my best work here. And so I think I've, I know a fair amount about Seattle. The interesting thing is we're here for a technology forum. We're here trying to understand how this applies to a whole range of issues. And about 15 years ago, Thomas Friedman wrote a book, The World is Flat. And in this instance, as in many, he was wrong. The world is not flat. It's very, very spiky. And if you take a look at where innovation occurs, it historically it occurred in port cities. So two years ago, I read Will Durant's 11-volume story of civilization, and it's just this reoccurring pattern. And now it occurs, uh, you know, obviously Chicago's not a port city. It is in some respects, but not in others. But it occurs at these inflection points where you're near a major research institution and you get this sort of alchemy of activity. And Seattle is one of those places. And so this is appropriate place for us to sit and talk about this set of issues and with the set of people that you've had here today. So now what I wanna do is condense three hours of content into seven minutes. This is foolhardy. We proceed. A strategic plan, and I'm, at the end of this, you're gonna find coherency that's just gonna stun you, but it won't seem that way as we progress. A strategic plan has three components, situation, critical issues, and objectives. The cadence is A, but B, so C. And in the situation, under the A's, you're trying to find all the objective data. What are the trends? What are the facts? What's the situation on the ground? Critical issues are fairly obvious. What are the impediments? And then the objectives. And what you're gonna find, and what I have found, is almost everybody does the Bs and Ds. Here's the issue, do this specific tactic. I would argue that that's our political climate today. There's, there's no framing, there's no situation, there's no putting critical issues in perspective, and there's no framing of objectives. Everybody's bitching about something and wanting somebody to do a very specific thing. That's not helpful. And that doesn't get you to where you wanna go. Another element of a winning strategy has three elements of a winning strategy. It's to own the future, right? And we, I, was just, I was just talking about strategy, right? You wanna skate to where the puck is going, right? Gretzky's great comment, right? How do you know that? You own the future by aligning with key trends that are bigger than any existing player. You think about the whole premise of a startup is that this new thing can disrupt an old thing. How does that happen? How does this thing that doesn't exist become a dominant market share player? Well, it happens because they align with key overwhelming trends that they then exploit, and so they own the future. So think about Uber. Essentially, best I can tell, they invented nothing, nothing. 
but they understood key trends that were then radically disruptive. Second part of a strategy is a place to start today. How do we get engaged? What can you buy? A lot of companies have failed because they sell futures and they don't have anything to sell. <laughs> you know, and so there's an immediacy to it. What decision are you asking somebody to make? And then the third is how do you get between the two places? So own the future by aligning with key trends, place to start today, and a way to get between. And the, and the way to get between is generally partnerships and affiliations and scale out. Right? So that's the last, the, well, no, there's one other construct. And then I want to go to what's the difference between a strategic plan and an operating plan. An operating plan takes your C's, your objectives, and turns it into what, how, who. What are we trying to do? How are we going to do it? And who's going to do what? And so that's, you know, objectives, strategy, people deployment. So now here's another uh, thing that often happens, right? Political organizations start with a who. We've got these people, wh what can we get them to do? <laughs> or how can we size the job for them, right? And so I want to lay all that out there and then talk a little bit about why I think these kind of forums today are important and why NBR is important. NBR um, essentially helps you with the, with the A's and the B's and the C's, and particularly the house, which is to say the organization through their web of relationships is trying to be a map, like where are we going? And then it's also trying to be radar, what else is out there? And then it's trying to be sonar, what are the currents that are below that are influencing what we're doing? And that informs both a strategic orientation and an operating orientation. And I think that's particularly important because I don't actually know in today's climate um, how to do the house. Like, I think, I think we could set up objectives and say, wow, trade would be good. I mean, it's entirely insane that we didn't do TPP, right? I mean, like any objective analysis would say, oh my God a trading relationship and bringing our allies together. And, and then uh, I've got a son, a crazy story, but you know, he's in Tongo right now. It turns out uh, our competitors are all over Tongo. Who knew? Uh, Roy probably did. I didn't know. But you know, we're, um, you don't get a sense that we're winning. And the other question is, what is winning? And then given our objectives, how are we going to execute it against those objectives? given the constraints under which we're operating, given our political constraints, global constraints, et cetera. It is, a, it is a very, very murky time. But I will say that we gotta do more than Bs and Ds because that's not getting us anywhere. One of the things I didn't, I'm not a super disciplined guy and I, I generally don't practice Lent, but I used it as an excuse to not turn the news on when I came home. <laughs> Just to buy myself, you know, uh, 40 minutes of not being incredibly agitated prior to dinner. And, uh, and of course, there's such a diminishing return to news because it's just an echo chamber, depending on what you're watching or what you're doing, right? But it, what it becomes dramatically apparent is, I, if I watched it all day long, which many people do, or they're getting their little, their little news feeds or whatever, like, right? That's not gonna get us to a better place. And so the question is, what is? How the hell do we get out of this mess? And series of messes, and how do we characterize the messes? And my encouragement and what I'm trying to do myself is, you know, step back, think about A, but B, so C. Get some clarity around objectives. Think a lot about trends. Trends are incredibly disruptive. We we're just talking about AI, right? The, the implication, I also have a crazy little technical lab that I'm still putzing around with, so I'm somewhat conversant with what's happening. Um, well, what are the trends we're trying to exploit? What are the human trends that we're trying to exploit? There's all sorts of interesting subterranean things happening that I think trend towards the positive. Uh, disillusionment happens right before positive change and potentially negative change. But what are those trends within 
our given societies, what are those trends across the globe? How do we exploit those? And how do we be thoughtful as we map to an operating strategy? How do we be thoughtful about what strategies we want to deploy and against which objectives? How do we be thoughtful about the people that we need to be in relationship with that can then execute against those strategies? And how do we be disruptive by bringing people outside that haven't been part of the equation into the equation? And I'll, I'll leave with one last thought, which is disruption always happens from outside. It generally happens from outside, right? You know, you know Steve Jobs, of course, disrupted many, many industries. Uh, in the day, Microsoft disrupted uh, the computing industry. Elon Musk, of course, is a fabulous disruptor. And they do it by pattern matching, right? They see things from outside and they come in. I don't know if you guys read this incredible book called Range. It's, it's you know, basically Roger Federer against Tiger Woods, right? Deep specialization versus a range of activities. And what you generally find is, on balance, range, being a generalist helps you solve more problems than being a specialist. It's because they're applying a different set of pattern matching to a problem. The other thing that happens that people don't understand very well, but I've thought a lot about it because I've tried to sell a lot of stuff over a long period of time, is the person that buys the new thing is rarely the person that bought the thing that's being replaced. So you think about that, right? So the person, you know, I, I was part of client server and now cloud and this kind of thing, right? The person that bought the, the 5250s and the 3270s is not the person that bought client server. The person that bought client server was a business unit manager. The reason that cloud has taken off is not OPEX versus CAPEX, it's that the, a new buyer is engaged that's closer to the money. In organizations, revenue trumps cost. If you want to find power in an organization, find the revenue generators, and they're more powerful than the cost centers. They just are. And so what's happened with technology, which has never fully been explained until you came here today, uh, what happens in technology is these advanced solutions that used to have to be uh, conceived of and deployed by cost centers are now able to be deployed by revenue centers. And that's driving the disruption. I have no idea how to apply that paradigm to a lot of the issues that we're engaging. I really don't. I've thought a lot about it. I've thought about how to get government to change. And uh, I'm like 0 for 6. And I, I really tried hard. Um, and I think the reason is, is that they don't have revenue. They, they don't have the equivalent of a line of business manner, uh, owners that you can appeal to them that have power within the system. I can tell you how corporations change. I don't know what to do when all you are is a cost center. I could talk for a lot longer, um, but I probably shouldn't because I know we have a really important and interesting panel. But I look forward to seeing you at dinner tonight. I want to thank you for being here today and for giving me a little time. Thank you very much.